Okay, so let's see. You want to set it up? Sure, sure. Yes. Okay, so Sharad is going to do his MS Defense. I guess he's done a bunch of different different things and he's choosing two of the topics to talk about in his thesis. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you for both to my community members and everyone else for coming to my uh, defense. And basically, so the to the the topic of, for my thesis is called an investigation of model like planning and multi agent planning. So basically, these are two areas within automated planning that has been recently been getting a lot of attention. So basically, what the thesis contains is two works I've done in, within these two areas. So since these are two sub areas within automated planning. I'll start with a very brief introduction to automated planning. So, as most of you would know, like automated planning is just a branch of AI which is which deals with generating goal-directed behavior for agents. So, uh, most planning algorithms aim at creating plans or policies which the agent can execute to achieve its goals, and it's a model-based method. So, usually, typically in most cases, a planning algorithm would expect a completely defined and correct planning model to be given to it, to perform its planning. So this is how a normal planning application would look like. You will have this agent planning model, will be given, your initial state and goal will be given to it, and the planner will produce the plan that the agent can later execute to achieve its uh, goals. So in this thesis, I'll be mainly focusing on these two sub-areas. One is the multi-agent planning, and the other is the model-like planning models. So when I say multi-agent planning, I mean I refer to planning in the presence of multiple agents. I don't necessarily mean only I don't always mean that there are multiple planning agents, but mostly there are multiple agents that are executing the plan. So within this area, I have done a work called required cooperation, and we will see what it is and why it is important and things like that. And the second work relates to model like planning models which are these incomplete planning models that can still be used for planning or plan-related activities. So like I mentioned before, one big, uh, most algorithm, planning algorithm, make this assumption that you have access to this completely defined model. Even when you assume you can learn these, that's not always easy to do. So I'll be looking at this specific model-like planning model named annotated PDDF, and similarly we'll see what that is and why it is important. And because it contains two topics, most of my talk actually will be focused on multi-agent planning model. But I'll also cover like the main ideas behind model, the annotated PDDL. And hopefully, if we have questions, we can discuss it during the, the QA time. So we will start with multi-agent planning. So the actual, uh, the actual work is called a formal analysis of required cooperation with multi-agent planning. I had done this work with both uh, Tony and Professor Rao, and this was recently presented in ICAP 2016. So, since the title itself says a formal analysis of required cooperation in multi agent planning problems, we'll start by looking at multi agent, multi -agent planning problems as a whole. For this, let's assume this blue box actually represents a set of all possible multi agent planning problems, so which we'll call MAP. So whenever you see map, it means multi-agent planning problems. Now let's take a look at a specific problem within this big set, namely the multi-agent blocks world problem. So blocks world is kind of this iconic pro problem, iconic planning domain within classical planning. And what we have is we have these different blocks on a table, and the goal of the agent is to form different shapes using it. So you have you would be asked to make some uh, pre-config like a con like a specific configuration, and the agents will work to towards achieving this. In a multi-agent box world scenario, you have to multi you have you can have multiple robots working to achieve this goal. But if one were to look at this problem, you could easily see that you actually don't require multiple agents to solve this. But of course, the presence of multiple agents can help solve this problem more efficiently. But it's not a bottleneck to actually solving the problem. On the other hand, if you look at another problem domain like depot, like the logistic block, sorry, where you have this goal of moving packages from one city to another, you have these two kinds of agents here. One is the truck, 
which can move from one part of the city to a different part within the same city. And you have these plane agents, which can take these packages from one airport to a different airport. So actually, if you look at this problem, you actually need these two kinds of agents to solve this problem. So here, the, the multiple agents are not just used for efficiency's sake, but you actually need them to, to be able to solve these problems. So within this larger set of uh, multi-agent planning problems, we can define this subset, which we call the required cooperation problem. These are the problems that can only be solved using multiple agents. So, uh, looking at this example of required cooperation, uh, re uh, required cooperation problem, one might imagine the reason why this thing requires multiple agents is because you have agents of different types. You have agents that can do only certain kinds of action, other agents that can do a different kind of actions, both of which is required to achieve them. So, uh, uh, obvious question is, does that mean required cooperation problem only involves similar cases, that you have these heterogeneous agents? Is that true? So let's just look at this specific problem, which we call the burglary problem. So it's a simple case. You have this room with a diamond in a pedestal. And your aim is to steal the diamond. But just the act of removing the diamond causes the door to the room to get slammed shut. And the door can only be opened from the outside. So unless you're Indiana Jones with a similar object that you can swap out, you need multiple agents to solve this problem. So this problem is a required cooperation problem. So now what we can see is this big set of required cooperation problems can be divided into two types. The, the type one problems, where you have problems with the same kind of agents, but where you still need these different agents to finish, to finish the problem. And you have these type two problems, where you have these different kinds of agents working together to solve the problem. Now, why should we care about these categorizations? So we've actually seen three types of, uh, of uh, like multi-agent problems. Why should anyone care? Because they, they are all multi-agent planning problems. So the reason why we should care is, actually, this, these, the category of these problems could actually uh, like inform the design of the planning algorithms that can solve them. For example, if you were to look at the multi-agent box for you could just think about a single robot solving the problem. You just plan with a single robot. And later, you could actually expand it to different, uh, different agents. So one agent does all the plan, and then I later decide this part of the plan will be done by this first robot, this part will be done by the second robot. Easier than considering all the agents at the same time. Similarly, for the second problem, if I had this, I add this imaginary agent called a flying truck. Now I can actually solve the entire problem using a single agent. And I can use a similar post-processing step to later divide it to the constituent agents. But if you look at the burglary problem, unfortunately, here we have to consider every agent to find a solution to this problem. So clearly, the kind of prop, uh, like the, the kind of category falls into <coughs> actually this uh, actually informs the design of planning method. The second part is this category should also uh, inform the choice of benchmarks. Because if you're deciding benchmarks to measure multi-agent planning problems, an important thing is it should come from all parts of this space. Unfortunately, if you look at something like ODMAP, which was this multi-agent planning competition that happened last year, you will see that most of these problems that were considered in this, in this competition actually came from the small slice of, uh, of this entire space. So it did not actually come from the entire spectrum of possible types of multi planning problems, but only belong to the small subtype. So clearly, this categorization is important. Now the question is, what have we done in this book? So we basically asked ourselves these three questions. One, what kind of conditions can actually cause required cooperation to happen? So given a problem, how can, can we say whether it needs required cooperation or not? Is there certain properties of the problem that can lead to required cooperation? Second, how do these conditions actually affect planning for multi planning? What I mean by this is, can we actually identify certain subclasses which are easier to solve? As we've seen, the, the, these, the classes where it belongs to actually defines the kind of algorithms you can use. Clearly, that is the case. And finally, 
given a problem which we know requires multiple agents and we give some kind of upper bound on number of agents that we need to use. So these are the, the three problems we've tried to ask ourselves in this, in this, in this work. So the outline of the talk will be uh, uh, following. So we'll start with what is required cooperation. We'll try to formally define what is required cooperation. We'll then go back to our uh, classification of our RC into two types. Because when we discussed it before, we didn't actually co cover what we mean by heterogeneous agents. We'll try to formally define this agent heterogeneity. Next, we'll actually look at the type one type one class of problems and try to identify reasons why there might be required cooperation in such problems. We will also look at under what conditions can we say that there is no required cooperation, that a single agent can solve the entire problem. And finally we will attempt to provide an upper bound on this, on these kind of, an upper bound on the number of agents. Finally for the type two, we will actually introduce this concept of transformer agents, which is this virtual agent which has these capabilities of all the individual agents. And we will see how we can make use of these transformer agents to simplify planning. Okay, so starting with RC definition, uh, what we are going to do is we are going to actually extend, uh, to in, before we can define RC, we need to define a multi agent planning problem. How do, and we will actually extend an existing formalism which is used to define planning problems called SAS plus. To, uh, and we'll extend this for multi agent planning problem. So, the original SAS plus uh, problem is defined as following you have the state variables, you have the set of actions that you can perform, you have the initial possible initial state, like, uh, you have the initial state, and you have the goal state. And each plan is given by this sequence of actions. And each variable can take, uh, each state variable can actually take its value from a predefined domain. So. Now, coming to uh, a multi-agent planning problem, now we define the problem as using this double. So where we have, similarly we have the, the variables, we have the initial state and the goal state. But now we also have this additional uh, uh, value phi, which represents the possible agents. And we define that for each agent, we have a set of associated actions. And we make an additional uh, assumption that all the goals are defined independent of the agents. So the goals are in like the agent should be at this position, but rather something that the agent achieves. And similarly, uh, we have the plans are now defined by actions as well as the associated agent that performs this action. Now, coming back to required cooperation, we will say that a given planning problem is k agent solvable if we can come up with a subset of k agents from the set of all agents, we can actually solve this problem. And we will say the problem has required cooperation if it's not one agent solo. So there is no single agent that can solve the entire problem. Okay, so now that we know what is required cooperation, we'll try to see uh, how we are actually going to divide the set of required cooperation problems to better analyze it. Because what we found out very early on is trying to directly infer whether like a given uh, given uh, plan, like a given problem is has required cooperation is piece based on instead what we've tried to do is we've tried to divide our set of possible problems into subtypes and try to identify properties within each subtype that can lead to required cooperation. So let's see how we are actually achieving this class, like how are we actually dividing these problems into subtypes. So like we discussed, now we have actually divided it into two types, type 1, which are just problems with homogeneous agents. Type two, which are the heterogeneous agents. So the, uh, the the question we need to ask ourselves is what is what makes a certain problems have heterogeneous agents? So we are actually going to define agent heterogeneity using these two new concepts: agent signatures and variable signatures. So basically, if you want to identify a capability of an agent, one way you can do it is just look at the the kind of the actions it can perform. Unfortunately, if you look at just the, the grounded actions, you might not be able to get a good idea about the capabilities because each of these sets will be unique because they will contain the agent name. So it doesn't really give us a good idea about the capabilities itself. So what we do is we actually replace, within this action list, we actually replace the name of the agent with this global symbol. So now what we have, 
the, the list then we get is called an agent signature. So now if we, ha we could have cases where two agents had completely unique action list, but they have the same agent signatures. Similarly, we will call the, uh, this variable signature, we get the variable signature by taking these agent variables, like location, and replacing the agent name with, the, with this global agent signature. Now, moving on. So now let's define what an agent heterogeneity is. So we will say that the problem con has is consists of heterogeneous agents if it satisfies one of these properties. Domain heterogeneity. These refers to the cases where agents have same variable, say like fuel, but they have different domain values. So in the case of our uh, logistic domain, the, the, f the value for fuel in the truck would be say gas, but for the plane it would be say kerosene or something like that. So and then we have the variable heterogeneity where agents have different variable signatures. So for the plane, it may have a variable called altitude, which the truck would not. Similarly, finally, the capability heterogeneity is where different agents have different capabilities. So uh, the plane can fly, while the truck can only drive on the ground. OK. So now, uh, we will actually uh, call these heterogeneous problems with this, uh, this acronym of DVC, which, rep uh, which which uh, represent the domain variable and capability heterogeneity. So when, whenever we, we say a DVC problem, we are going to refer to like the heterogeneous problems with agent, like agent heterogeneity. Now, moving on to our type one. So this is an interesting type because now what we have is we have agents of same type. So any question to ask is when would you need multiple agents this? Because each agent can perform its own actions. Like every agent can perform all the required actions. So one possible case is when there may, may when maybe the state space is not completely traversable. A good example would be is if the agent uses some non-renewable energy. So it's a it's a robot with a limited battery. So once it runs out, it cannot complete the task. So it will need another robot to take up from where it ended. So this is one case where you will need uh, multiple agents, and we will actually capture this through a concept called causal graphs. So causal graphs has been widely used in planning, usually to, uh, uh, to analyze the structure of the problem. So usually causal graph consists of, it's, actually, uh, uh, it's a graph consisting of no, where each node actually represents a state variable. It can have a directed edge or an undirected edge. So uh, if we have two variables, B1 and let's say like B1 and B3, it will have a directed edge between them if there exists an action which updates V3, but has V1 as a prevail condition. So there is one action which updates V3, but requires V1's value to stay, to have some certain value. So we'll have a directed edge in that case. And we will have an undirected edge between two variables if there is an action that updates both. So these are kind of, so these, that would mean like there's one action which updates both, in this case, V3 and V2 at the same time. Okay, so in this work, we are actually going to use a, a variation on the causal graph, which we call ICGS, which we obtain by replacing these agent variables with a variable signature, which are these, uh, which we obtain by replacing the agent name with this global symbol. Okay, now we define these two new concepts, the inner closure and the outer closure. So, inner closure we define as these set of variables which are not connected to any other nodes through directed edge. So basically what we have here is we have this set of variables that get updated together. So they are kind of interconnected to, to each other. And we define outer closure for a given inner closure, which is basically these variables which are connected to this inner closure through these directed edges. So for the inner closure V3, V2, we have this outer closure V1. Okay. Now, we will say that a given, uh, given inner closure is locally traversable. If for any two values of inner closure, we can come up with a plan that connects them, given that, uh, assuming that the outer closure can take in any of the values. And we say the causal graph itself is traversable if all of the inner closures are locally traversable. So, uh, question one might ask is, so given if we have a, 
a causal graph that is completely traversable, that does that mean we don't need multiplexes? Unfortunately, that's not the case. Now let's go back to the the problem of the burglary. So we know this one actually requires multiple agents. And if you look at the causal graph of this problem, we will see that it's actually locally traversable. So you have these two variables. There's only one inner closure, and you can actually find it locally traversable. Hence, the entire causal graph is traversable. But we know, we know from our previous discussion that this is not an RC problem. So what's going on? What we find out that Sorry. Uh, what we find out that when, even when the causal graphs are traversable, these causal loops, like this loop here caused by this walkthrough action, can actually cause the problem to require multiple agents. Which brings us to our first theorem, oh, which brings us to our first theorem, which says that even a multi-agent planning problem with homogeneous agents, if we find out that the ICGS is completely traversable, and there are no causal loops, we can say that a single agent is enough to solve the problem. Due to lack of time, I won't go into the proof, but we can always talk about it later. So now, now that we know that there are certain problems which does not require RC, let's go back to the these problems, those has, have the causal loops. We know that they require multiple agents. But can we give some kind of upper bound like on the number of agents required to solve them? So, what we found out that, that, that so in this in this specific case, if you look at it, the, the reason for the causal loop is this walkthrough action. So let's assume I add one more agent. Now the walkthrough action is no longer limited, no longer uh, limited by this door locked uh, variable, because another agent can now open it, and I can walk through as I can update the location of my first agent without worrying about the fact whether the door is locked. And what we basically found is, for a given causal loops with a given causal graph with causal loops, the number of agents are actually upper bounded by the product of each variable signature associated with the causal loop. The product of the domain values of each of these variable signatures within the causal loop. So what we basically do is we we'll take these these variable signatures and replace them with a number of agents, each representing the possible values you can hold. And this way, we can actually break causal loops within the causal graph. So this finally brings us to the, the second part of the first section, uh, so which is uh, analyzing uh, problems with their heterogeneous agents. So one thing I wanted to make clear is, just because a problem has heterogeneous agents, that doesn't mean it has required cooperation. Because there may be still be problems within logistic domain when you only need to move within a city. That's not a required there's not a problem which requires cooperation. Also, when there is required cooperation in heterogeneous agents, it may not be because of the heterogeneity. It may be because of the causal loops or the traversability of the state three that we discussed before. So so given these two caveats, we are actually going to focus on a subtype of these Type two, uh, type 2 problems, which we call VDCRC. These are a set of type 2 problems where we know the required cooperation is because of heterogeneity and not because of any of the earlier cases we've discussed about. Now, for, for this, what we are trying to do is we will introduce this concept of transformer agents, which is these virtual agents. And what we will do is we will try to simplify planning within this subset of problems using this new concept of transformer agents. So the question is, what is a transformer agent? So transformer agent, like I discussed, are these virtual agents, which actually has the capabilities of each individual agents. So if you go back to our logistic domain, where you have a truck and a plane, our transformer agent might be a flying truck. So it can go both through within the city and can also fly from one airport to a different airport. And now we also define this idea of connectivity graph. So where we say this is a graph consisting of agents as its node, and there is a connection between two agents if their state space are intersects at some point. So basically, there is a point where the agents, agent one state space and agent two state space actually move to. 
and what we have found out is given a DVCRC problem and if the, the connectivity graph of that problem is a single connected component as in there is a path between every agent what we found out is we can solve the entire the original problem using a transform agent so let's assume this is our connectivity problem for a logistic domain so we have one truck and one plane and the truck meets the plane in the airport okay so that's the point where their state space intersect now we can think about a flying truck which starts from this initial question goes to the airport and then flies to the second city and drops a package there so now we have a transform agent plan that can solve this original problem similarly we found out that within problems with completely connected connectivity graph given a transform agent plan we can decompose them into single agents, which kind of makes sense because transformer agent is actually performing actions of original agents. Can I, can I sure. ask a question? So this means, in principle, if you want to see whether your plan is solvable using a multi-agent problem, you can just create one artificial agent that has all the actions that the, the others can do, then you solve with any regular planner, and then yes. once you have the plan, you know I can now decompose it. Absolutely. Okay. But with the caveat that you don't have any causal loops in the causal graphs and there is state traversability and stuff like that. Because if it's state traversability, one agent cannot completely go through the yeah. entire place. So those are cases still. So and that would actually bring us to a very interesting point later on, which I, I want to hear yeah. now. Yeah, sure. So this is the example I wanted to say. So this is a transformer agent plan where you have this flying truck moving from one part one part of the city to the airport, then flying all over the to the next airport and dropping off the package. And now we can actually decompose it into our original agent where we have a truck going to the airport and then the, the, the truck will actually drop the package here, the plane will pick up the package and move to the second airport and will drop off the package there. So interestingly we now have a way of compiling it into a transformer agent pro problem and then uh, compiling it back to an actual a plan with actual original agents. So what we've done is, and we know this is actually only applicable to DVC RC problems. So we've proposed to this planner, this is a centralized multi-agent planner called RC plan, which makes use of this concept to simplify planning problems. And uh, what we what it does is it takes an original planning, uh, original multi-agent planning problems, compiles it into a transform agent problem, and solves this problem, which is very easy to solve now because it's a single agent, and then expands it later. What we found out that is if we had originally solved, like so let's take a specific domain, Xeno Travel, which is this uh, plane domain where there's only plane agents moving from one city to another. We will see that if the domain had six agents, at any point of search, it may have to take care of, like look at 54,000 possible actions because there are six agents and six actions. Why for our transformed agent problem, we only need to care about 9,000 actions. So it's a dramatic reduction in, in the state space and we can actually easily expand this later because now, yeah sure. So the, the fast downward, that's basically a version of fast forward. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a planner that uh, has a long, large number of heuristics. Okay. So uh, yeah, but the fast forward one is a specific heuristic based planner. Okay. This is actually a framework for planning. You can okay. add new heuristics and stuff like that. So finally, what we did was we actually took this this benchmark, this supposedly multi-agent planning benchmark, which is this problem that we used in the last ODMAP competition, which is this planning competition for multi-agent planners, and we tried to run a run a plan on it. And what we found out surprisingly is we are able to solve almost in all of the problems, even though we designed our plan only for this specific subset. So the, what it means is like most of the time when we are like people were designing the benchmark, they didn't really care about whether this problems actually required multiple agents or not, and which we feel is something that needs to be fixed. And we also found that we also compared our planner against uh, uh, existing centralized planner called Map Lab Creative, which actually did very well in this competition. And we found out that our scheme actually did better in terms of the time for their set of problems and we went for larger problems we actually found that we did good on all three criteria which is the coverage the number of problems you can solve the time you took to solve which is the agile score 
and finally the quality of your plan. This is the sad score. So we did better than them when we had larger problems. So finally, this brings us to the conclusion of our first part. I'm really sorry it took so much time. So uh, basically, we have here introduced the notion of what, what required cooperation is. We've tried to formalize it. We've tried to identify properties of certain subset of problems that can lead to this required cooperation. We've introduced this new planner, which can actually solve these problems, like solve a certain subset of this problem. And we also analyzed the existing benchmark, multi-agent planning benchmark, and found out that most of the benchmark are actually restricted to us, only a certain subset of possible kinds of multi-agent planning problems. So that brings us to the end of our first section. And now we'll move on to the second section. Uh, do you want? Do you have any questions? I can. I think I'll just move on directly. Yeah. So uh, basically, in this section, I'll be talking about a area called model-like planning models. And the work I've done on this specific model within a, a specific model-like planning model called annotated PDQ. Yeah. So, but uh, before we can start, let's take a look at what a planning model is. So as we've discussed before, planning is a model-based approach. So you actually expect a model to be there which captures the agent's capabilities and the environment dynamics. And in most, for the most basic domain model, it can be represented by this tuple given here, where we have a, a symbol for all the possible states. We have a symbol for possible initial states. In, uh, we have a, we have a, we have G, which represents possible goal states. We have your set of actions that the agent can perform. The transition functions, which captures what the result of these actions are. What will happen when you perform an action? And you finally have the cost of these actions. So what we've seen is most of these planning algorithms not only expect a domain to be present, it expects a complete domain. OK, so now it brings us to model-like planning model which are these incomplete planning models that can still be used for planning or in some cases plant related activities. So here is this, this spectrum of possible models. On one end you have this full planning, uh, full model which is used in traditional planning and on the other end you have nothing, there's no, no information at all, you can do nothing with that. But in the middle you can see a number of increasingly incomplete models that are still useful. Like, these approximate models which can be used for robust plan generation, which we'll see later on. You have these capability models, which actually captures human capabilities and can be used for plan guidance, goal recognition, stuff like that. And you have these shallow models where you don't even have any domain, it just captures the affinity between actions. But even those models can be used for plan to take between auto completion of plans and stuff like that. So what we will do in this section is we are going to only focus on this part of the spectrum. This is basically annotated PDD. And we will look at its application and uh, the, the original planner which was used to for this models and the extension I've done. So now, uh, the, the actual, uh, the, the 